Hello. Um, how is everybody? Hi, Kay. Glad you're here. Please do what you can when it comes to sharing. I know Facebook's getting in our way these days. Okay. We have a lot to cover tonight. I trust we will get some people joining us. Some more folks joining us. Even though we are a small group now. Oh, there's Carmen. Woohoo and hee haw. I'm riding out a wonderful, savage, tropical storm here in Miami tonight. I absolutely love it. How's everyone? Extra special shout out to the marvelous Dr. Joe and Bodacious Bonnie. Hey, Bodacious Bonnie, how you doing? I'm not getting an answer from Bonnie. She must be absorbed in. <laughs> she must be absorbed in the, in the broadcast right now. Okay. <laughs> I am uh, going to start to share things and talk about them. And we're going to see where we're going now. Okay. First, we have a piece from Dave Dayen on the 11th, which is today, the unsanitized column. Donald Trump's terrible coup attempt is killing Americans. How? It's pulling focus from the most dangerous moment of the crisis. This is the COVID-19 daily report for Veterans Day 2020. And there's a woman being wheeled out of a hospital in Queens, New York on Tuesday. And just before we go into Dave's coup attempt, let's briefly review where we are right now with regard to fatalities and such things from COVID on the Worldometer site which I have just refreshed. We have total deaths, 247,397. That's what it looks like now. Earlier today, that is today, up to this point, we had 1,478 new fatalities, 142,808 new cases. Yesterday, we had 142,212 new cases and 1,465 fatalities. So now we're not moving along at 1,000 a day any longer. We're moving along at a fatalities pay, pace of close to 1,500 per day. So, in fatalities per million, we are now at 746. We are moving up fast and quickly. We're number eight in the world, as usual, but we're closing in on Bolivia. I don't know that we're closing in on Argentina now. Argentina's moving very fast, and they're closing in on a number of other countries. But we are catching up to Bolivia. 
by the way, uh, Evo Morales came home just a couple of days ago, and I have a short take that will be coming out on that sometime this week. Looking at the reproduction rates, we have now, as of today, only two states that have a reproduction rate of less than 1.0, North Carolina, which has at 0.99, and Mississippi at 0.84. The reason why Mississippi is doing so well is probably not many people are going to Mississippi these days, so the spread is less. Okay, Alaska is at 1.00, so hopefully it may be ready to fall below 1.00 reproduction rate. Everybody else is at 1.01 or higher. The highest in the country is Maine right now, 1.49. And Vermont is in a sorry state also at 1.33. And New York is at 1.30. Once again, in deep trouble. California is at 1.1, in pretty deep trouble itself. And Virginia is at 1.1 as well. I won't read off some other states, but I'll get back to Dave's piece now. It is now clear that Donald Trump is trying to pull off the world's worst coup attempt with Joe Biden in a small but, but measurable and likely insurmountable lead in multiple states. By the way, Dean Baker, the um, economist, from the Center for Economic okay, and Policy Research, the CEPR, uh, has done a little piece where he projects what the likely margin Joe Biden will have when all the counting is done in the popular votes. And according to the projections by Dean, based on some reasonable assumptions, we're going to arrive at 8.1 popular vote margin for Biden. So in no way, from the standpoint of the popular vote, is this even close. Trump's lawyers are using bogus voter fraud claims with no evidence behind them to try to jump to a lead in the courts. He's claiming that the sequence of the counting, something mandated by Republican... um, by the legislatures in Republican states and telegraphed by Trump before the election proves the fraud. He's relying on the testimony of convicted sex offenders and postal workers who recant their stories upon questioning. On multiple occasions, lawyers have admitted to judges that there's no proof behind their claims. Trump's point is to muddy up the results just enough so they can carry out another telegraphed strategy in validating the certified results and having the legislatures from Republican states deliver a slate of Trump um, electors, overturning uh, the results of the voting. There aren't really enough states with full Republican control of government to make this happen. But if you create contested, competing slates of, um, of electors in Pennsylvania or Wisconsin, where there's divided government, maybe you deny anyone 270 electoral votes and throw the election to the House okay, of Representatives. We're based on the current results and the nature of that process. Trump would uh, win. Hmm. That could be, but if it's only Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, then I don't think there are enough electoral votes there. In other words, uh, if we're looking at all the other states that Biden is getting, we're looking there at 306 electoral votes. Now, there are 20 electoral votes in Pennsylvania, and if I'm not mistaken, Wisconsin has 11. I don't, I think 
altogether that's 31 so it doesn't get Biden down to less than the 270 that would be needed. Now maybe Trump would be able to do something in Georgia as well but uh, I'm not sure that would work at uh, the moment. But anyway, uh, to go on with Dave's piece, I went over all this in my uh, last magazine feature, The Winter of Our Discontent. This is a comical version of it, where the election is not really in doubt, and the coup attempt is completely brazen and stupid. That doesn't make it benign, of course. And the groups that were planning resistance need to get in the faces of these state legislatures, lest they see a free path to stealing the election. But given that this is unsanitized and we cover the pandemic, I'm inclined to explain how this ham-fisted effort at banana republic politics is going to get a lot of people killed. Not necessarily people in the streets. That's not what Dave is talking about here. What he's saying is every moment Donald Trump tries to steal the election is a moment that he's not paying any attention to the most harrowing moment of the coronavirus crisis. He is, after all, the president of the United States. Cases are now completely out of control. We could easily hit 200,000 a day soon, as I just pointed out. We're at something like 142,000 a day right now. Hospitalizations are at an all-time high, and we're approaching triage conditions in several states. The medical profession has been able to save lives as they learn more about the disease. But if they cannot attend to all the patients, many people will die unnecessarily. In North Dakota, where some astronomical percentage of the population is hospitalized with COVID, they're allowing asymptomatic carriers to keep working because they have no reinforcements to treat people. Sidelining medical staff is a big, as big a problem as having too many patients. Even if we had the capacity, everywhere cases and hospitalizations have risen during this crisis. Deaths have risen as a consequence. And cases and hospitalizations are now rising faster than we've ever seen before. It's not limited to one region of the country, although the Midwest is in the worst shape. That's doubly troubling because the virus is spreading the most in the areas with dilapidated health systems and shuttered rural hospitals. Uh, one clinic in Billings, Montana, saw its IC unit at 167% of capacity just yesterday. But hospitalizations are rising everywhere. The Midwest may just be ahead of the curve coming for the rest of us. Things don't look too good in New York. They don't look too good in Vermont. They don't look too good in Maine, do they, right now? This is more serious than any time in the spring or summer, says Dave. Behaviors are not changing and people are focused on other things, which is absolutely true. People are focused on things like worrying about Thanksgiving and parties and things like that. People are still going to restaurants, which are not shut down okay, in many cases. Um, um, but people are focused on the season. They're focused on work to the extent uh, they possibly can be. Until recently, they were focused on the election as the primary thing people were focused on. Pandemic fatigue has fully set in at the worst possible time. The Trump steal attempt has sucked up all the attention. All the attention among the executive branch and among the media. And Dave asks, I wonder if the fact that New York and California are experiencing relatively mild outbreaks has also led the media to not be taking this um, seriously. Well, if the RT rate has anything to say about it, it will soon be very serious in New York once again. In not too many days, the RT rate is fairly predictive. It means that in the next two weeks, we're going to get a serious spike up in New York. Serious spike up in New York. Obviously, a coup attempt, however stupid, is worth our attention. But the death toll that's indirectly resulting will grow. The executive branch has completely checked out on any responsibility for this massive public health crisis at precisely the moment when the crisis is most acute. 
What's most frustrating is that we know exactly what to do here. Restaurants, gyms, cafes, and other indoor venues accounted for 80% of all new infections during the first three months of the pandemic, based on cell phone data. If we just shut down these venues and pay them to stay closed, something our government can easily do, we would get a shockingly large handle on the situation. Yet we've had absolutely no discussion of this in the highest levels and no leadership in Washington looking seriously at this option. It's absolutely infuriating that we're going to consign people to death and suffering because nobody in the White House or Congress can be bothered. And yes, this world's worst coup attempt, this grab at power for power's sake, has pulled far too much focus. People are dying and many more are going to die. When will anyone wake up? Well, I hope here we've gone over the statistics enough times that we're all woke that that's a problem, that Trump is once again killing people with his self-centered behavior. He's planning on embarking on another round of super spreader events. He's not paying any attention to COVID. He intends to let COVID burn out on the bodies of the American people. That is plain. Is there anyone at this point observing that who's even considering that he should go on as president of the United States? I think he should be impeached right now by Pelosi. And I think that Mitch McConnell should be dared to find Trump not guilty this time or to pigeonhole the impeachment. It's ridiculous. Ridiculous. It's a crime in itself. Makes Mitch culpable for these deaths. Okay, next. On the agenda is a piece from Common Dreams by Julia Conley. Written on November 10th. It's called, If Biden Wants to Be FDR, He Should Immediately Cancel Student Debt. Um, the President-Elect Urged to Go Big. And progressives are calling on President-elect Joe Biden to immediately cancel student loan debt upon taking office in January, a move proponents say would transform the lives of millions of working Americans, boost the economy, and position Democrats to maintain popular majorities long into the future. I don't know if it would quite do that, but it would certainly be popular for the next two years and energize people for the 2022 elections and energize people right now if a coup has to be blocked. While the Republican Party may well retain control of the U.S. Senate following last week's elections, though Democratic victories in Georgia's uh, but two runoff elections planned for January could change that, Biden would be able to use his executive authority to clear all student debt held by 42 million Americans, totaling $1.6 trillion. If I remember correctly, that's about 80% of all student debt. All student debt, that about 80% is owned by the government. And so Biden would have the option of doing that. As the Debtors Union Debt Collective wrote, in an extensive Twitter thread over the weekend, just as Biden was announced as the projected winner of the 2020 election, uh, the president-elect could direct his education secretary to unilaterally cancel all student debt using a provision in the Higher Education Act. So, the article has various tweets uh, outlining the powers that Biden has. There's no doubt he has them. And uh, the debt uh, by collective tweeted, thus the Secretary of Education or her delegate has the ability to cancel or write down claims against student debtors 
either unilaterally or in exchange for something else, apparently for any reason or for no reason. A demand echoed a 2015 call by Senator Warren, who pushed uh, President Obama's Education Department to use a provision under the Higher Education Act known as uh, Borrower Defense to cancel the debt of college students who were defrauded by for-profit institutions. Pressure from Warren pushed the department to clear hundreds of millions of dollars in student loans. Canceling the debt okay, of all the borrowers, said author and activist, uh, um, 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 author and activist Naomi Klein on Tuesday would put Biden on the path to running the country as President Franklin D. Roosevelt did as the U.S. faced the Great uh, 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 Depression. And there was a tweet uh, by Klein saying that he should immediately cancel student debt, launch a rebooted Civilian Conservation Corps and National Youth Administration. Um, but during the Depression, those two programs created millions of jobs for young people repairing their communities and the natural world. And he could do it as a living wage, too. I think he has that authority. That would cause the private sector to have to pay a living wage to everyone if the federal government established that as the minimum wage de facto. While running in the Democratic primary against progressive senators Bernie Sanders and Warren, who called for a complete cancellation of student loan debt and relief for up to 50000 in debt for some households respectively, Biden displayed skepticism of student loan forgiveness. After winning the president, after winning of the nomination, Biden unveiled a plan to cancel 10000 in student loan debt for every year a public servant works up to five years and half payments for undergraduate federal student loans. He also endorsed um, uh, um, 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 he endorsed uh, proposals by Senate Democrats to offer 10,000 student loan forgiveness for every borrower in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic. Warren was joined by Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer in September in a more ambitious call demanding White House wipe out 50,000 in student loan debt per borrower. Um, um, in an interviewer with writer and commentator uh, Anand uh, Bajiradaradas on Saturday, Schumer repeated the call saying Biden's first 100 days in office ought to look like um, FDR's. Quote, getting rid of student debt, we believe that Joe Biden can do that with the pen as opposed to legislation, Schumer said. Um, Far-reaching action to cancel student debt, say proponents, would stimulate the economy by freeing up the household budget of tens of millions of Americans, more than 25% of whom are currently behind in their loan payments. Action taken by Biden would also be broadly popular. The hill harris X poll taken last year showing that 58% of registered voters support student loan cancellation. And progressives on social media echoed the call of Klein and the debt, um, the collective. Specifically, uh, Jay Apollo, Pramila Jay Apollo tweeted about that. Uh, and the New York Times wrote uh, something saying Biden can't be FDR, but he could still be um, LG Bay. Um, LBJ, he has the power to make transformational progress look like, come on, man, common sense. Will he use it? And so we have a lot of people calling for something. Hopefully Biden will hear about it. Hopefully he will take it seriously. It is a no-brainer political opportunity to become very popular in very short order without the ability of Congress to interfere, or without the ability of the Senate to interfere as long as the Democrats continue to control the House, which it appears now they're going to do. It looks like they're going to win 225 House seats, uh, which means they will have lost eight, but it will be 225 to 210, so they'll have enough of a margin 
uh, to pass things if they maintain party discipline on, on, on in the House. Uh, okay, going on. Now, there's an article by John Kelly from Common Dreams, demanding White House climate office and fierce cabinet picks groups urge Biden to claim his, quote, FDR moments. FDR moment, and there's Biden answering questions from the press at the Queen in Wilmington, Delaware, on November 10th. Okay, the left is not waiting for permission to be heard, which is good news in itself, and they have some fierce, quote-unquote, cabinet picks in mind for Joe Biden, as well as a plan to help save the planet from climate destruction and the U.S. economy from uh, from ruin. Uh, there's a coalition of progressive advocacy groups circulating a memo on Capitol Hill, arguing that bold, transformative policies in the next Congress will be essential for the Democratic Party to win the kinds of policy changes that will improve the lives of ordinary people, as well as solidify the party's electoral prospects above and beyond what was seen in 2020. Okay. And a related effort launched Wednesday morning is pressuring President-elect Joe Biden to move swiftly to make tackling the climate crisis uh, by making a major national um, economic um, um, uh, major national uh, economic mobilization and energy system transformation plan central to his first year agenda. First reported by the New York Times organizers from the Sunrise Movement and Justice Democrats began an active campaign Wednesday for Biden to create a White House Office of Climate um, of climate mobilization, as well as to appoint bold uh, progressive leaders to prominent executive branch posts as a way to transform the nation and achieve lasting change after four years of destructive environmental policies and regulatory rollbacks by the Trump administration. The groups argue that trying to compromise with Republican Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell should the GOP retain control of the upper chamber would be a disastrous miscalculation and are urging Biden to take bold steps with his executive authority and other tools. According to the groups, Biden has a 10-year window to stop the worst and most permanent effects of climate change. He can avoid Senator McConnell's uh, delays by creating a brand new executive office and senior position with wide-reaching power to combat the climate crisis, just as we mobilize to defeat the existential threat of Nazi Germany in World War II. This new position will convene and coordinate across the president's cabinet agencies and ultimately hold every federal department accountable to the national project of stopping climate change. Uh, the Office of Climate, of the Office of uh, 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 Climate Mobilization, will deeply embed this mission into all of our spending, regulations, policies, and actions. Uh, the Office of uh, will not require Mitch McConnell's approval. Joe Biden can and must appoint a qualified leader who is trusted by the climate and environmental justice community. Alexandra Rojas and Varshini Prakash, executive directors of Justice Democrats and the Sunrise Movement, respectively explained, there is no more time for incrementalism and corporate-friendly half-measures on the part of Democrats, not when the planet is burning and the economy is on the verge of seismic uh, the collapse, and there are quotes uh, from the two of them, and there's a video from the Sunrise Movement as well. And Democrats have a once-in-generation moment uh, to deliver policies at the scale of the crises our generation is facing, said Sunrise's Prakash, 
who also served as an advisor in the Biden Sanders Task Force on climate policy that came together after Bernie Sanders left the primary. So they're basically tweeting at um, the Biden, um, trying to create a groundswell. Um, Avarshni Prakash said, quote, uh, young people helped to deliver this uh, historic majority to Joe Biden. Uh, the Senate can't be an excuse uh, whether or not uh, Senator McConnell remains the majority leader. We need an office of uh, 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 an office of uh, uh, climate mobilization and visionary personnel in the Biden administration who are ready to use every tool to f in their disposal to create millions of good paying green jobs, unquote. The groups are also urging Biden to appoint people who are progressives to key leadership posts, including Sanders for Labor Secretary and Representative Deb uh, 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 Halland for Secretary of the Interior, Senator Warren for Secretary of Treasury, Keith Ellison for Attorney General, and Representative Barbara Lee for Secretary of State, and Economist Derek Hamilton the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. So their wish list for the cabinet includes both Warren and Sanders. Uh, we got to look. For Secretary of Labor, they specified three candidates, Senator Bernie Sanders. And Mary K. Uh, uh, Henry, the international president of the SEIU, the Services Employees uh, International Union, the biggest uh, service employees union, or um, Andy Levin, who's a congressman from the House of Representatives, okay, in Michigan. Now, it isn't clear that Bernie Sanders would accept an appointment. It may depend on the outcome of the Georgia runoffs in January, because that would create the 50-50 tie, which would give Bernie the chairmanship of the budget committee and also a subcommittee chairmanship um, in the health area. He wants those two things, but he can't have them if there's not a majority for the Democrats, or at least a 50-50 tie, okay, if the Democrats were to win in Georgia both seats, it would be a 50-50 tie, okay. And without a 50-50 tie, he might prefer to stay in the Senate. With a 50-50 tie, I should say, he might prefer to, uh, to stay in the Senate. Okay, and be the committee chair, that's a position of considerable power. Uh, okay, um, I don't know how he feels about that. If there's no majority, then he might prefer to make his last engagement uh, to become Biden's uh, um, the Secretary of Labor and to push Biden um, in the same way Francis Perkins pushed uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the 1930s. I'm sure that's what he's thinking along the lines of. That's his particular model. Uh, Warren wants Secretary of the Treasury, uh, but Biden has not been that friendly to that. For one thing, he doesn't want to uh, have a Senate seat um, uh, vacated uh, with a governor of Massachusetts who's a Republican and who would then be appointing a Republican. So uh, Biden's going to be very concerned about that. And so he's probably not going to want to give the post uh, to Warren. That's actually okay with me because I have no indications from Warren that she understands anything about the mechanics of money in the Federal Reserve Bank. So I don't know how 
as Secretary of the Treasury, I don't think she knows how to deal with the Fed. Now, Sarah Bloom Raskin has been with uh, the Fed. She's been on the Board of Governors okay, of the Fed, if I'm not mistaken. And she's also been an Assistant Secretary of the Treasury. She knows how it works from, uh, from both sides. And she's a friend of Jamie Galbraith's as well. And I think Stephanie knows her too, Stephanie Kelton. So I think she knows how the money works. And therefore, she'd be a much better Secretary of the Treasury than Warren. Okay. I know people want Warren because ah, finally we have a Secretary of the Treasury who will not be so friendly to Wall Street. But Sarah Bloom Raskin is also a progressive uh, and uh, she's unlikely to be overly friendly to Wall Street okay, as well. So we want a Secretary of Treasury in there who knows a bit okay, of MMT at least. Sarah Bloom Raskin is that person. I don't think okay, that Elizabeth Warren is. I don't think okay, that Robert Reich is. I don't think he knows anything about the details of money at all. I think he would be inappropriate as Secretary of Treasury. I have no idea why uh, these uh, these um, um, advocacy groups okay, are nominating him for this. But anyway. And uh, Deborah Holland is there. She seems like a very good choice for Secretary of the Interior. I think that Raul Grijalva would also be a very good choice. I think both are more progressive than Huffman is, uh, uh, by Jared Huffman. I don't know why they nominated him. Uh, sometimes I think they don't know exactly what they're doing. Now, as National Economic Council Director, there is Joe Stib uh, um, Stiglitz. Joe Stiglitz is a very, very good choice. In my view, he is better than the other two. Uh, the only person I would suggest who would be better as chairperson of uh, the Economics Council uh, is uh, Jamie Galbraith. Uh, I think uh, uh, that Jamie Galbraith is more alive to the details of how the monetary system works. And he is just as progressive as Joe Stiglitz um, any day in the week. Having said that, Joe Stiglitz is a Nobel Prize winner, and of course that counts for something if you've got a National Economics Council director who is a Nobel Prize winner, Economics Prize winner. Uh, that counts for something. But I think Jamie is the better person to have in this particular situation. Now, one favorite of uh, um, Joe Biden's okay, is actually Jared Bernstein, who was his uh, chief economist. But whether he wants to appoint him uh, to head up uh, essentially a policy, uh, what's a policy body, uh, the National um, Economics Council has a director who's an economist. Other than that, there are governmental decision makers, uh, mostly from the cabinet and other um, high level decisioners who come to the meetings okay, of the Economics Council, who sit on the council. So in this case, okay, the economist is uh, the person who manages the flow and also communicates, I think, what um, economists are thinking such as the economists on the Council of Economic uh, uh, um, uh, um, um, Advisors, uh, which is another body. That's the body of economists. That's the body that does the research. We'll get to them in a few minutes. Secretary of State, Barbara Lee is being considered as a possibility, okay, for the progressives. She would be very good. Um, Ro Khanna would be very good. Chris Murphy would be less good, less committed to diplomacy, and less committed 
to peaceful transitions in international affairs than either Roe or Barbara Lee. Personally, I'd rather see Barbara Lee. The reason why is Barbara Lee is at the end of her career in Congress. She'd be a good Secretary of State. However, I think especially on the diplomacy front, uh, whereas Roe is at the beginning okay, of his career, and he has the capability and the visibility to become a future Speaker of the House and perhaps a long-term Speaker of the House, and a very influential figure in House circles okay, as well. I think in the end, uh, actually more influential than Chris Murphy in the Congress. So of the three, I would say Barbara Lee okay, is the best choice. Secretary of Agriculture, Shelley Pingree would be very good, and Marsha Fudge would probably be good. I don't know what Cory Booker knows about agriculture. I have no idea why he's there. And um, he was the mayor of Newark. <laughs> Come on. And then for Secretary of Transportation, they have Sarah Nelson, uh, Anna Presley, and uh, um, but Chewy Garcia, uh, um, Diana Presley, okay, I wouldn't want to tap her. She's a key member of the House. She's extremely valuable in the changes, okay, in the reformations there. She's a member of the squad. Yeah, she's certainly bright enough and good enough to be the Secretary of Transportation, and she'd be a very good one. But we need her in the House, okay, very badly. Um, the Chewy Garcia, not so much, okay, I don't think. Uh, Sarah Nelson would be great as Secretary of Transportation, but frankly, I think Sarah Nelson is the best um, a candidate, um, but given that Bernie Sanders is really needed um, in the Senate, I think the position of Secretary of Labor should probably go to Sarah Nelson as opposed to putting her as Secretary of Transportation. Now, here again, they want to put a Secretary of HUD. Uh, um, uh, the, their prime pick is Rashida Tlaib. No, I think Rashida Tlaib is needed in the House. She's producing legislation in the House, which is revolutionary. She needs to be in the House to help to push that legislation through in the coming years. We need her there. That's a key, a, a key position. Um, Karen Bass, okay, on the other hand, okay, I don't know that she's so essential um, um, in the Congress. Uh, uh, by Jumaine Williams, okay, I'm not sure he has the kind of stature. Uh, Okay, now, I know there are not many people who are going to like this, but Julian Castro was a good secretary, okay, of HUD. And even though he's been an establishment Democrat, he's always tried to push the envelope in that particular environment. If this Biden administration was going to turn progressive, Julian would be pushing for all kinds of good things in HUD. Julian is very bright okay, and is very able. Okay, And I frankly, um, okay, I'm not saying he'd be a better choice than Rashida, considering uh, strictly the job. But what I'm saying is um, it's Rashida who is needed in the House for her leadership and her ability to drive the agenda um, um, in the House. We need a whole squad in the House. We don't need people robbed from the squad um, right now. We don't need either Jayapal to go into the administration or Rokana into the administration. I don't think that's good. 
we need them in the house to help to take over the house. Anyway, there, okay, is Karen Bass. She's not really driving change in the house that much. She'd probably do a good job as the HUD secretary. Okay, Derek Hamilton is picked as the chairperson of the Council okay, of Economic Advisors. Um, uh, my feeling is that Stephanie Kelton is a better choice. Now, I think Derek is great on the job guarantee, but uh, generally speaking, I don't think he has the understanding of MMT Stephanie has. She's one of the leading figures, okay, in the MMT movement, including the job guarantee. Um, I don't even think that Derek's version of the job guarantee uh, would be as generous in terms of defining a living wage, okay, as Stephanie's would be. And I think that Stephanie does a lot more than the job guarantee. Now, I know the baby bonds proposal of um, that Derek Hamilton. Um, that's a good proposal. I think Derek Hamilton, okay, is very good. I'd confirm him for the Council, okay, of Economic Advisors in a New York second. He'd be great on there. But I think the chairperson should be Stephanie Kelton. Okay. She's the person who has the Washington experience. She's the person who can manage the flow. She has contacts on the Hill. Um, her academic uh, contacts, of course, okay, are very, very great, increasingly great. She has the, the visibility now with a best-selling book okay, she put out. She's very much in touch with the research um, community. I think Heidi Shareholtz uh, would be pretty good for the CEA also. I'd like to see her on there. That would be fine. But I think for chair, it should be Stephanie Kelton. And I'm looking also for Pavlina Chernyeva as well to be on the CEA. I would love to see that. For Attorney General, Keith Ellison, it was mentioned. I think that would be a great pick. I think that Larry Krasner would be a great pick. I know the Michigan Attorney General is doing a very good job out there, but the others have, uh, Keith Ellison has much more experience in the DC environment. He was a congressman for so many years, a former chair of the CPC, former co-chair, okay, of the CPC. Uh, he'd be great and Biden could trust him. Okay. So I think he is the top pick. That is a good uh, top pick. Oh, Jay Apal. They're planning on putting Jay Apal as Secretary of Health and Human Services. We need her to push the Medicare for All bill through. We need her to get increasing seniority in the House. She's a future leader of the House. Okay, if anybody was to contend with Nancy Pelosi for the speakership from the left right now, she and Ro Khanna are the two most likely people to be able to pick up some centrist support. She should not be drafted for health and human services. No. Um, Abdul Al Said, he'd be great. He'd be great. Um, but Berwick, okay, I, I wouldn't say that uh, I'm not sure what kinds of policy smarts he has, uh, what kinds of administrative smarts he has. Okay, of these three, I think I'd go with El Syed, certainly. So that's what I think of these particular choices. But I'm doing a video on cabinet uh, choices. Uh, I'll probably do it either tomorrow, okay, or the next day. So I'll take this up in more detail in the context of other choices that have been mentioned that um, many of whom are not uh, very progressive. So 
Okay, I didn't want to cover that. Uh, I thought that was extremely interesting. It's part of our moving on. Uh, but I have to accelerate this because I'm, okay, I'm a little behind. I may sort of spill into tomorrow somewhat. But with some of these, I ought to be able to speed up pretty easily. So Bernie says, Democrats need a winning message in Georgia. Bernie Sanders says, fight for $15 an hour minimum wage. He noted 47% of workers in Georgia make less than $15 an hour. 71% of voters in Georgia support increasing the federal minimum wage. This was written on November 10th by Kenny Stancil, staff writer at Common Dreams. Uh, so Bernie is calling for them to run on $15 an hour. If they don't do that, they're stupid. $15 an hour just passed in Florida. They had a statewide initiative and a majority of voters in Florida voted for a $15 an hour minimum. They can do this in Georgia, too. There can be a majority of workers in Georgia, okay, a majority of voters. Moreover, if $15 an hour is on the ballot with respect to these people running for the Senate, if they're both promising $15 an hour, if the Democrats take over the Senate, that is a powerful incentive for people to vote in the runoff on January 5th for the Democratic um, um, candidates. Of course, the two Republicans will be fighting against that. They can't match that $15 an hour. They're not going to even try to do it, and no one would believe them anyway because they'd never get it through a Republican Senate. So, I think that was a great proposal by Bernie. We'll be considering some more proposals as we go forward. Next is... Next relates to the runoffs in Georgia. Specifically... Uh, one of the candidates in Georgia in the senatorial campaign, specifically Purdue, David Purdue, tried dog whistling to his uh, supporters about John Osloff being Jewish. Okay, so they they tried Sub Rosa to smear him as being Jewish, so unacceptable for the Senate okay, in Georgia. There's reason to believe that brought the race. Um, but closer because Asaf called it out and called it out uh, actually very convincingly. But in you know in other ways, Asaf is an idiot. Uh, he got interviewed by someone in Georgia uh, who gave him uh, you know an issue positions quiz, going quickly through um, all kinds of uh, uh, issue positions, like uh, for example, Medicare for all. Okay, you know, and the idiot said he wasn't for Medicare for all. Then he was asked about the Green New Deal, and he said, oh, no, I'm not for the Green New Deal. Then he was asked about um, defund the police, and he said, oh, no, I'm not for defunding the police. So he was going down the line with Joe Biden. That is not as good a position in this Georgia race at this point as going with the Bernie Sanders' positions. It's just not going to be as popular. If you add to the $15 an hour, I'm for the Green New Deal, I'm for Medicare for All, um, I'm... <laughs> defund the police doesn't mean completely defunding the police. It just means shifting some of the police budget to other departments that can handle 
situations, very delicate situations, a lot better than the police can. He can easily make that point that he's not for removing budgets from the police department entirely. So he can easily defend himself okay, against that. Anyway, but this next article is relevant to that in the sense that, of course, the Republicans uh, then tried the opposite tack they try to smear the other Senate candidate, okay, who was Raphael uh, Warnock. They try to smear him uh, as being, okay, an anti-Semite. He was defended by Code Pink. Code Pink defends Georgia Senate candidate Warnock after GOP's opponents' anti-Semitism smear. Now, Code Pink is a uh, it's an organization that focuses primarily on foreign policy and issues of war and peace and it's extremely active it's it's been of course uh extremely active in defending julian assange okay and also chelsea manning and um, uh, Ed uh, Snowden, the anti-war group Code Pink on Tuesday jumped into the fray over allegations of anti-Semitism leveled by Georgia Republican uh, by U.S. Senator Kelly Loeffler uh, uh, against uh, her Democratic runoff opponent, the Reverend uh, Raphael Warnock. Um, on Monday, she accused Warnock of a long history of anti-Semitism, including embracing, quote, the anti-Zionist uh, Black Lives Matter organization, unquote, and believing that, quote, Israel is an oppressive regime for fighting back against uh, the terrorism. Noting that it is, quote, an organization with a number of Jewish leaders, unquote, Code Pink said in a statement Tuesday that it, quote, strongly condemns these false accusations of anti-Semitism against Warnock. The group added that it, quote, finds it ironic that the senator making false accusations against Reverend Warnock is herself a supporter of incoming Republican Congresswoman uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who has made blatant Islamophobic and anti-Semitic statements and Port supports the conspiracy group uh, by QAnon. And um, 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 um. A, a tweet was sent by Max Berger, who said, white um, nationalists use Jews to attack progressive leaders of color because they want to divide us with hate. It's as, as transparent as it is grotesque. We know you support a president who incites uh, racism and anti-Semitism. Keep our name out of your mouth. This was a retweet at uh, Kelly Leffler, who accused uh, Warnock of a long history of anti-Israel extremism. He defended uh, Jeremiah Wright's anti-Semitic uh, comments. I saw those comments. They were not anti-Semitic. He embraced the anti-Zionist uh, 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 BLM organization. Anti-Zionism is not the same as anti-Semitism. And that's a conflation the Republicans use all the time to go after people who oppose the foreign policy okay, of Israel. So Max Berger said, if you actually cared about Jews, you'd ask why they voted against Trump three to one. Most Jews understand Trump is inciting hatred and violence against people who are not white uh, Christians. Okay, addressing the issue of whether the Israeli government perpetrates apartheid, Code Pink wrote that it's, quote, uh, um, um, it's military occupation of the West Bank 
is composed of separate roads for Israelis and Palestinians, checkpoints, and a military court system that subjects two different groups of people to two separate, separate sets of laws, unquote. Quote, anyone who's traveled to the West Bank city of Hebron, as the Reverend Warnock did with the National Council of Churches, is immediately confronted by the visceral and appalling reality that Israel is opposing a system of apartheid on the Palestinian people, the group asserted. And from Code Pink, let's get a few things straight. Um, the denouncing Israeli occupation is not anti-Semitic. Advocating for human rights is not anti-Semitic. Calling anti-Zionists anti-Semitic does not justify um, 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 Israel's illegal um, um, occupation okay, of Palestine. And as a Jew, I endorse completely that particular tweet. Last week, Israeli and Jewish American media published reports that Warnock signed a letter accusing Israel of uh, perpetrating apartheid following a 2019 faith group trip, trip to the Holy Land. Warnock um, and the delegation visited both Israel and the Palestinian territories it illegally occupies and colonizes with Jewish-only settlements. And the article goes on, okay, in that vein, uh, the important thing is that the conflation of anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism is an erroneous and false conflation. They are not the same thing. Criticism of Israeli foreign policy is not the same, okay, as a uh, um, criticism of Jews, and it's not the same as criticism of Israel uh, as a nation. It isn't the same thing. Um, and according to the Jewish allies, okay, of Warnock, he is a strong supporter, okay, of Israel. His opponent, Kelly Leffler, tweeted falsely that he is um, anti-Israel. There's a report from Jay Insider with a misleading headline, teed off the scrutiny of Warnock's uh, Israel views. And uh, Jewish Dems tweeted throughout his career, uh, Warnock has worked to build ties with the Jewish community in Georgia and with Israel. Read in his own words why he stands with Israel and how he will advocate for the Jewish community and Israel in the Senate. He said, quote, without, uh, by reservation, you can count on me to stand with the Jewish community and Israel in the U.S. Senate, he said on November 9th, 2020. So that's it. It's a smear. Uh, we do not respond to smears. And there are videos, okay, of Warnock showing that he is not, okay, an anti-Semite uh, in this article. Okay, so that's all I'm going to cover of this. Georgia Jews support Warnock for the Senate. Many more Jews will support Warnock than will support uh, Kelly Leffler, the corporate Democrat, the crooked corporate Democrat who benefited from inside um, information about the COVID uh, 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 pandemic while she failed to convey that information to her constituents. Okay, next on moving forward.
we have a piece from the week uh, by Ryan Cooper, The Difficult Lessons of Democrats' 2020 Victory. And he points to the conflict that we've been paying attention to uh, at the end of last week and this week, okay, as well. Uh, uh, the moderates who lost or had close races are blaming the left, particularly the squad of lefty women in the House. And Connor Lamb said, quote, we pay the price for these unprofessional, unrealistic comments about a number of issues, whether it is about the police or shale gas, unquote, claimed uh, Connor Lamb of Pennsylvania, who barely won his seat. I have one thing to say to common, uh, Connor Lamb. What does unprofessional mean? And what does unrealistic mean? Those words don't mean anything. All they mean is that Connor Lamb doesn't like what the lefties have to say. He doesn't even say why he doesn't like it. He just labels them unprofessional and unrealistic. It is an exercise in, in, in uh, labeling, in smearing. No more and no less. In truth, the results of the 2020 um, election, says Ryan Cooper, are a model, a muddle, sorry, not a model, a muddle. And nobody can credibly claim to have the secret ideological formula for victory. What the Democratic Party must rely on is long-term organizing and leveraging power to deliver concrete policy wins whenever they can. Okay. Uh, um, um. Above all, they need courage. You can bet your sweet pippy. Let me start with a big caveat. This election was extremely unusual and therefore may not have much in the way of lasting political lessons. Donald Trump was a unique incumbent, inexperienced, utterly incompetent, monumentally corrupt, a massive drama queen, and on and on. There, he's still a massive drama queen. There was the worst pandemic in a century and the associated economic crisis. Turnout was probably the highest in 120 years, with both liberals and conservatives coming out in staggering numbers, and in several states the last votes are still being counted. Just isn't clear at all what a more normal election with candidates who are not deranged reality TV celebrities might look like. Though who knows, perhaps the next presidential election will end up being The Rock versus Hulk Hogan. That said, we can tentatively conclude that neither leftists nor moderates can claim unqualified victory for their politics. In the progressive organization, Justice Democrats produced a regression showing that more lefty candidates, that's a statistical technique for those who don't know, showing that more lefty candidates were slightly more likely to win, but the correlation is minuscule. Some lefty candidates, like uh, Kara Eastman uh, in Nebraska, lost in swing districts where Biden won. The right-wing ballot initiative, Prop 22, passed easily, in deep blue California, though on deceptive grounds that it was pro-worker, while the progressive tax reform, Prop 15, is trailing as the remaining votes are counted, though it is close. On the other hand, uh, uh, but the moderate candidates also lost in many states, while ballot uh, 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 while ballot initiatives to raise uh, the minimum wage to $15 an hour in Florida, to decriminalize the uh, 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 psilocybin mushrooms, otherwise known as uh, magic mushrooms in Washington, D.C., and to decriminalize all drugs in Oregon, all passed uh, easily. Every house incumbent in a swing district who sponsored um, uh, the Medicare for All kept their seat and marijuana legalization was on the ballot in five states, passed in every one. The most convincing explanation for all this I've heard is that Democrats as a party simply had a fairly good night instead of a very good one. Very good one they were expecting and had in the midterms. Democrats in marginal districts or states on average were more likely to lose no matter if they were moderate or progressive. Senate Democrats may have been most hurt by the media narrative that Biden was likely to win, which seems to have triggered the dread, quote, 
we need to check on the president, unquote, thought process among most incomprehensible swing voters who for some reason prefer a completely paralyzed, dysfunctional government. They're probably libertarians. That's why they want it. They don't want any government. Conversely, it is increasingly clear that even with Trump horribly bungling the pandemic response and the ongoing economic crisis, hey, the political background conditions were not as favorable for Biden as they seem. Polling and reporting confirm that the strong economy of 2018-19 was very popular, as well as the CARES Act checks and boosts to unemployment. Uh, it turns out Trump's instinct to take credit for all that free money was politically smart. At least enough people believed him that they thought it was his economy for some crazy reason. In that context, it's important to remember that moderate Joe Biden was at the top of the ticket. The presidential candidate is naturally going to have by far the most influence over the shape of the national campaign. This makes complaints from moderates like uh, House Majority Whip Jim Clyburn that uh, the left is to blame for unexpected down ballot losses completely ridiculous. Biden did not support any of the left-wing policies that have been discussed of late. On the contrary, he constantly ridiculed and attacked them. Uh, uh, in the debates with Trump, he dismissed the Green New Deal and Medicare for All. Elsewhere, he said, uh, uh, he said the police should uh, get more money. All, half the premise of his candidacy was that he was the safe bet who would be immune from right-wing attacks that he is a radical socialist. Yet now, when those attacks seem to work in Florida, it's still the left's uh, fault. Uh, whether it's motivated reasoning or simple dishonesty, quote, anything bad that happens is always the left's fault, unquote, is the operative principle for many moderates here. Uh, he points to Abigail Spanberger, an ex-CIA moderate, yelled on a Democratic conference call that anti-police rhetoric nearly made her lose when she actually got a greater share of the vote compared to her 2018 vote. So she got a greater share of the vote, but <laughs> she's saying that it was the left that made her lose, or that almost made her lose. Alas, in politics, the repetition of misleading, simplistic talking points usually works much better than thrashing out complicated truths. Okay. At any rate, the clearest political problem for Democrats is the mindset revealed by this entire discussion the party and its voters are terrified of the Republicans and desperate for some time of guaranteed political winner. Given the appalling presidencies of Trump and George W. Bush, one can see why, but there simply is no such magic formula. What does work is political organizing, even if ideologically left-wing candidates do not automatically win. The massive surge of attention to leftist issues around the George Floyd protests produced an enormous surge in Democratic uh, voter registration in many states, while Georgia has become a competitive state because progressive organizers have cut the share of voting eligible residents who are not registered from over 20% four years ago to just 2% today. Isn't that amazing? and tied the bulk of those new voters into political organizations to turn them out for Democrats specifically. Colorado has become a solidly blue, blue state, in part thanks to its state party, which is perhaps the best organized in the country. I submit that what Democrats need is some guts. Consider Republicans who almost never evince the slightest worry about public opinion. Just now, the Republican legislature in Florida is preparing to gut the $15 minimum wage referendum mentioned above, just like they gutted the felon enfranchisement referendum that passed in 2018. It's a safe bet that con contemptuous disdain for the will of their own voters will have no effect whatsoever uh, um, 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 on people in Florida reflexively voting GOP. <laughs> Some things just can't be explained. Uh, in no doubt, it helps Republicans to have a completely shameless propaganda apparatus defending their every move. And of course, one would not want Democrats to start swilling conspiracy garbage until their brains dissolve, as many conservative base voters have done. Whether or not policies are popular does still matter. But confidence, um, 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 aggressiveness, 
and careful organization do pay political dividends, and Trump's unexpected strength on the back of honking great piles of free money suggests that even the crudest kind of government support wins political favor. If President Obama and the Democrats of 2009 had gone for full employment through thousands of literal Obama bucks as a crackpot, as crackpot uh, Republicans accused him of doing, we would be living in a very different country today. Yes, if Obama had followed MMT advice, which was available back then, and he had gone for full employment with a huge uh, stimulus bill, we would be living in a very different country today. If he had done that, if he had passed Medicare for All, H.R. 676 back then, we would be living in a very different country today. We would have moved long since to attempt to handle the climate crisis. The Green New Deal would have come earlier and would have passed a lot earlier. The question Democratic... Obama was a total failure. What a waste he was. The question Democratic moderates must face is whether they are willing to include or even listen to their leftist party members who generally comprise their youngest, best organized, and most media savvy fashion. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, undoubtedly the biggest rising star in the party, says she has offered her advice and expertise and been turned down and has gotten so much abuse from the aging party elite that she is seriously considering quitting politics altogether. No, no, we need you. Whether moderates can avoid driving out the rising generation or whether the left continues furiously organizing and demonstrating at the grassroots level, okay, as uh, Osita Wanavu advocates at the New Republic, may determine whether or not Republicans manage to complete their project of turning America into a one-party state. I thought that was a really excellent piece and very wise in terms of what Democrats should be doing, but are not at this point um, actually doing. There was another good piece um, 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 in the week that we will consider right now also. I think this is it. Yes. How Biden can save his agenda under divided government by Noah Millman. When all the major networks called the presidential race for Joe Biden on Saturday, celebrations erupted in cities around the country. But by Monday morning, it was clear the victory being celebrated was a largely negative one. Donald Trump was getting out, but the Senate wasn't. Uh, not really going anywhere. So consequence, we're told the most Democrats could hope for is continued trench warfare. Start with a furious effort to win two Georgia Senate of runoffs, which would give Vice President Harris the tie-breaking vote in the Senate. If that effort fails, retreat to government by decree. Extensive use of executive orders would enable Biden to enact at least some of his agenda acting appointments would allow him to bypass the Senate confirmation process. Finally, the Democratic House uh, would uh, uh, would be able to prevent um, any legislative uh, rebook to these moves and would send a series of uh, um, um, the progressive laws to the Senate to set up a campaign in 2022 to replace, quote, do nothing, unquote, GOP senators in Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Wisconsin, and elsewhere. That would be one approach, but notwithstanding the hyperpartisanship of recent years, I don't believe it is the only possible one. I don't know whether it's the only possible one myself, but I think it's a good one. But anyway, um, but Noah Millman thinks there's a better option, better for Biden politically and better for the country. Joe Biden will ascend to the presidency in a position of distinct partisan weakness, but he also has distinct personal strengths. If he uses the latter effectively to counteract the former, he could actually make progress on the most important parts of his agenda, and doing that may be the key to reviving the flagging fortunes of his party. 
His personal strength doesn't stem from his warm personal ties to many Republican senators. These don't hurt, but they're not likely to overcome powerful partisan incentives. Rather, it is rooted in his popular support. He not only won the decisive majorities in both the popular vote and the Electoral College, he also ran notably ahead of his own party. While Biden improved on Hillary Clinton's numbers and rebuilt the blue wall, and the Democratic House majority looks likely to shrink, and in several states, most notably Maine, but also Georgia, Michigan, and Minnesota, Biden outperformed the Democratic Senate candidates. He ran also notably um, um, notably ahead of much of the progressive agenda, where that agenda was put to a serious electoral tests. Considering the results of a series of initiatives in California, one of the country's most liberal states, and the home state of Kamala Harris. By clear margins, California has rejected a proposal to reverse the state's ban on affirmative action, uh, rejected a proposal to eliminate uh, the cash bail, I rejected a proposal to expand cities' abilities uh, to enact uh, rent control and approve a proposal to allow companies like Uber and Lyft to continue to hire gig workers as contractors rather than be required to treat them as employees. While not every vote went against uh, the left, property tax proposals are still too close to call, and the voters did approve restoring voter rights to citizens on parole for felony convictions. The overall tenor of the vote strongly suggests that even in California, most voters have not yet sold on much of the progressive wish list. Well, what counts is that they're probably sold on student debt elimination, on paid family leave, on Medicare for all, on the Green New Deal, on the federal job guarantee. Uh, I think people in California are sold on a lot. I don't think you can just compare uh, the propositions that passed because there are many reasons why votes on that might turn out okay, in different ways, including the fact that the campaign on Uber and Lyft in California was extremely dishonest, okay? It was presented as a pro-worker um, um, campaign, which is not true, okay, at all. And of course, the other side didn't have the money to counter it because Uber and Lyft had huge quantities of money to invest in this because from their point of view, their whole business depended on it. Biden then is in a very strong position to personally claim a mandate for compromise in the service at the, of the issues at the heart of his agenda as he himself describes it, fighting the pandemic and restoring the economy first and foremost, followed by fighting climate change and systemic racism and improving access to quality health care. On many of these issues, I believe there are opportunities for precisely that kind of compromise, provided the Biden administration prioritizes um, action. Start with the pandemic. Donald Trump Turn the coronavirus into another front in America's omnipresent culture war. But not every Republican sees the matter through that lens. Senator McConnell has been avoiding the White House for months, precisely because of its laxity on masking, for example. He's not in uh, uh, denial about the virus itself. If the priority is fighting COVID, he is a potential partner across the aisle and an absolutely necessary one if Biden is going to try to jawbone GOP governors into more aggressive mask mandates. Senator McConnell will only be a partner if his interests are taken into account. What are those interests? Asks uh, Noah Millman. He says, uh, Senator McConnell's priority for months has been limiting business liability for the spread of coronavirus. His other likely concern about um, any proposal to build a large federal corps of workers to do testing, tracing, and other COVID-related public health tasks is that this would expand the ranks of public sector unions. This is the same issue that bedeviled the creation of the TSA during the Bush administration. Those are not negligible points of difference uh, with the uh, Democrats, but for that very reason, if either issue became the sticking point for passing a bipartisan bill, it's not clear to me which party would be viewed as holding negotiations uh, 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 hostage. Indeed, it's entirely possible that Senator McConnell is holding the better hand. 
I don't think he'd be holding the better hand on the business uh, uh, liability issue. The reason why I don't think that is because the liability issue is being framed by the Democrats um, um, correctly uh, as um, uh, making businesses liable when they are negligent, when they are not taking any precautions against the spread of COVID in the workplace. Businesses that have been taking precautions have nothing to fear, nothing to fear from not doing anything. The businesses that would be in trouble are those that don't care about um, their workers that are doing nothing to safeguard the personal safety of their workers. I don't think Democrats ought to give way on that under any circumstances. And I don't think McConnell is holding the better hand on that. Now, because so much of the public is anti-union, he might be holding the better hand on that public sector union thing. And maybe the Democrats would have to bargain that away if they wanted a contact tracing force. But what they ought to do instead, of course, is to negotiate. Okay, is to negotiate protections for the workers outside of the union framework, because that's just a matter of a little additional money. And McConnell can be gotten to compromise on that, I have a feeling if he really cares about the spread, okay, of COVID. He must be paralyzed with fear right now with the spread. It's spreading all over, and he's an old man, and he's subject to the same dynamic as all the rest of us. Maybe he can get better medical treatment, but, uh, I mean, a 78-year-old old guy getting COVID, it's a good chance you can kiss your ass goodbye, as the saying goes. Same dynamic applies to economic stimulus and relief. Senator McConnell's been very willing to provide relief for favored industries. He's been much more reluctant to continue providing support to individuals through extended unemployment insurance. Ironically, since that support is probably one thing that buoyed his party's fortunes in the election, probably. He has been exceptionally reluctant to bail out cities whose finances have been devastated by the pandemic. In the latest wave of the pandemic, though, the rural areas are getting hit harder than cities are, even as numbers are rising uh, everywhere. At a time when interest rates are at zero and the Federal Reserve is begging for fiscal stimulus, Biden should try to simply outbid GOP resistance by offering a form of support that provides needed help to cities, but is disproportionately favorable to rural areas. I don't understand why it has to be disproportionately favorable to rural areas. It seems to me it should give both the rural areas and the urban areas what they need in support. I don't think McConnell is going to vote against giving aid to rural areas that the rural areas need because it's the rural areas in Kentucky that elect him and that elect um, by Rand Paul and that elect senators of the Republican stripe um, across the whole country. I mean, they elect uh, Chuck Grassley in Iowa. Okay, they elect all kinds. Okay, of rural people, the rural vote continuously comes in for them. So, if the author thinks that Mitch would deal for heavy aid uh, to rural areas, give them what they need. That's fine. They've had the short end of the stick in America for ages and ages and ages. Give them what they need. Give the cities what they need too. We can afford it. Meanwhile, the best strategy for economic um, recovery has always been to get the virus under control till the vaccine is available and then distribute the vaccine as aggressively and quickly as possible. Biden should have no trouble finding allies across the aisle for the latter. What he needs to do is make clear that efforts on the former aren't a last minute power grab with the vaccine just over the horizon, but are even more sensible in precisely that context since the herd immunity that a vaccine would provide 
is far more effective when the prevalence of the virus is generally low. The same approach could be used with respect to climate change. Biden is going to face the greatest GOP resistance when seeking to impose additional taxes uh, um, uh, or regulations. The former is simply a non-starter. And by the way, in the short run, that's all right. The reason why, okay, it's all right is because, of course, we can deficit spend to get what we need in much greater proportion than we have in the past. When we realize that the government, the federal government is a monetary sovereign and that uh, that deficits are no threat as long as they don't trigger uh, inflation, we can spend what we want with respect to climate change as long as we take care to ensure that the spending won't be inflationary. And we can do that. We can do that. And Republicans will inevitably denounce but may not be able to stop uh, the executive orders. In other words, the new executive orders for the regulations, okay, that are necessary. They'll make a lot of lo loud noises about that, but they won't be able to stop them. And Biden can do a lot for the climate with new regulations. But Biden will need GOP partners to spend money on, on a better electric grid, on non-carbon transportation infrastructure, on uh, adaptations to um, 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 improve uh, um, 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 our, our uh, resiliency to climate um, the catastrophes, he should make it a priority to find GOP partners. There's a segment of the GOP that is increasingly warm to industrial policy. Some of its members, like Florida Senator Marco Rubio, are from states that are acutely vulnerable to climate change. The Green New Deal as a whole is always going to come in for GOP mockery, but the portion thereof that consists of infrastructure spending and subsidies to domestic industries shouldn't have to wait for 2022, provided, again, the administration is willing to give GOP senators wins of their own as part of any compromise. I think Biden is probably the kind of person who would be willing to do that. Does the above approach amount to the kind of triangulation that will depress uh, supporters on the progressive side and lead to a split um, in the Democratic Party? Perhaps, says Milman. Biden's interests are not perfectly aligned with Democratic Senate hopefuls who would like to blame the GOP Senate for obstructing everything. But they aren't entirely misaligned either. Nothing at all gets done, particularly on fighting the pandemic and providing um, economic stimulus um, 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 uh, and uh, 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 also relief. Voters are as likely to blame the Democrats as the Republicans perhaps more so, and Biden can perfectly well champion bills coming from the House okay, to provide a public option within Obamacare to hike uh, uh, um, um, upper bracket tax rates and to boost uh, the, uh, the minimum wage, all popular proposals that will be dead on arrival, and the GOP Senate that will give plenty for Democratic Senate candidates um, um, to run on. Now here, here, I would say, screw the public option. If the bill is going to be dead on arrival in the Senate anyway, go for Medicare for all, because you can really beat up the Republicans for voting against Medicare for all time after time after time. In fact, if you beat them up on Medicare for all enough, they might well be amenable to coming to a compromise on the public option. Because what is a public option? It is a compromise. It was a compromise position that people favored in 2009 because they thought that to go to Medicare for all was a bridge too far. Nobody preferred it okay, to Medicare for all except those people who wanted to keep the health insurance companies in business. There were a lot of those people, of course. 
But right now, there shouldn't be any more people on the Democratic side who want to keep the health insurance companies into business. In business, there shouldn't be. They've killed enough of us. It's enough already. Go for broke okay, on Medicare for all. Yeah, the GOP is going to turn it down. Run on Medicare for all in 2022. More than 70% of the people are for Medicare for all now. Close to a majority of Republicans themselves. And you get a big victory in 2022 in the midterms. That's what you do. What about the bus saw of GOP hyperpartisanship? Isn't it in McConnell's interest to refuse to strike any deals with Biden? Just as it was in his interest to obstruct Obama uh, um, um, at every opportunity. And won't a phalanx of Republican talking heads led by the ex-president make compromise toxic anyway? Perhaps, says Noah. However, McConnell can't afford to be seen as helping Biden politically or as having um, been um, outmaneuvered by him. But he's in a different position than he was in 2009. Then the Democrats controlled all branches of government, so McConnell, not the judicial branch, so McConnell bore no consequences for anything that went poorly, amplifying partisan polarization made life extremely difficult for vulnerable Democratic senators. Now it's McConnell's own caucus that could come under pressure, provided Biden makes a pitch aimed at those senators, median voters, and not to the median uh, Democrat. There's no guarantee that such an approach could, uh, could work. I'd argue the median Republican voter right now is a Medicare for all voter. Is a Medicare for all voter because close to a majority of Republicans give their support to Medicare for all right now, according to the polling. 70% of voters give their support okay, to Medicare for all. 88% of Democratic voters. If you pitch Medicare for all, you're pitching it at all those voters. There's no guarantee, Democrats, Republicans, independents, there's no guarantee that such an approach could work, either in terms of getting practical results or in terms of um, actually positioning a Democrat's well for 2022. But it strikes me as far more promising than the alternative. The core message of the Biden campaign was that he would de-escalate the partisan warfare that has increasingly characterized our politics. The same election that gave him victory further entrenched those partisan uh, divisions. If Biden has a mandate for anything, it's to govern across that, uh, that divide he has to try. I don't believe that's true, but that is one proposal and one suggestion, I think that uh, that Noah Millman made a good argument for that, but there are other arguments against it. Now, okay, I don't have time to go into those other arguments today, but there are other arguments, and I'm going to take those up um, tomorrow. There are still two pieces I did not cover today. And uh, those arguments are in the other pieces that I did not cover today. So I'll cover them tomorrow night. For now, I'm going to go to your comments. Okay. So here we are. Ah, 11 of you still here. Thank you. Thank you for being still here. That's excellent. I'm going to go back to the beginning and start considering your comments. Evelina says, a Native American community is trying hard to educate their people. Shout out to their efforts. I hope they're successful. Aral says, everybody knows that for a long time. Has he ever ran for any type of office? Uh, I'm not sure who he is because I don't see any comments before 19 after 9. Uh, Carmen says, um, educate them about uh, what? Carmen says, any type of office uh, correction. K says, no, he's an economist. Uh, um, Evelina says, um, Avril Mano to protect themselves from COVID. Deborah Wilson says, Steve Gonzo, surprise, surprise. Steve Gonzo says, 
Um, the cannabis blocks COVID uh, receptors. If you've got some research on that, Steve, I'd like to have a link to it. Uh, Carmen says he just recently kind of got on board, okay, with MMT. Who he? Who he? And Avril says, uh, um, Evelina Apont, fantastic. Kay says, I've heard that, Steve. Um, Deborah Wilson Wright. Steve Wolfbrand said, I doubt that both Dems in Georgia will win. Yeah, it's going to be very hard for them to win. The favorites in both races right now are the two Republicans. Even though Warnock got um, more votes in his race than um, uh, Kelly Leffler did, uh, she was running against another Republican as well. If you add the votes of the two Republicans together, they had more votes okay, than Warnock had. On the other hand, a recent poll was taken, and supposedly Warnock is ahead in Georgia at this point in time, 45% to 41%. Okay, so he supposedly has a thin lead um, at this point. Of course, the Republicans will throw in a fortune to win, um, but Kelly Leffler has already put in $20 million of her own money just to get to the runoff. And she's got a huge amount of money. She's a billionaire. She can put in another forty million if she wants, another sixty million. She can flood the airways with what she wants to spend. So we got to keep that in mind. On the other hand, Georgia is organized. The Democrats in Georgia are organized. They don't need a whole bunch of money to get their message out. It's more like uh, dependent on what that message is going to be in Georgia. Is it going to be the weak tea, the thin gruel that they've been offering until now? Or are they going to come out for Medicare for All and the Green New Deal and elimination of student debt and paid family leave and the job guarantee? and all the other great programs that people really want. They want them in Georgia just as they want them in other states in the United States also. Alvarez says, the Higher Education Act, I that something federal, and why doesn't the federal government help schools? Certain, certain dollars are appropriated for schools. Okay. But... This particular ability to forgive debt was written into the act without providing a particular appropriation. Why? Because an appropriation was not necessary. Doesn't cost the federal government anything to forgive debt. It really doesn't. It doesn't require an appropriation to forgive debt. Now, private company would have to have an appropriation, that is, would have to have the income in if they wanted to keep their assets um, uh, stable. But the federal government doesn't have to keep their assets uh, stable because they have the one big asset that's worth an infinite amount more than any other asset, and that is the ability to create their own currency and the fact that they are, the federal government is a monetary sovereign. Albert says, I read Biden's transition team is being funded by war hawks, probably. Rick Maynard says, evening all. Hey, Rick, how are you? Evelina Pond says, apparently a black university got a big boost from the federal government. Forget which one. Probably Howard, right? Avril says, Yang is moving to Georgia to assist um, Ossoff okay, and Warnock. Ah, that's really good. That's really good. Okay, I wonder whether Yang is campaigning uh, for a position in uh, Joe Biden's cabinet. Uh, remember, no final decision has been made um, um, on the head of the Department of Energy yet. I suspect Yang would do a really good job as the head of the Department of Energy as the Secretary of Energy. Do they fund grade and high school? Uh, there is some funding under certain programs uh, for state okay, and local 
um, um, education is formula funding. Okay. But of course, there's not uh, the kind of funding okay, that would allow the federal government to control what goes on in local schools, because of course, across America, local communities want to make sure the federal the government doesn't control the programs in local schools because then the federal government might not allow people to teach creationism and other crackpot theories that local communities really like. Evelina says, do they like Yang down in Georgia? Well, once they hear about basic income, everybody likes Yang. Also, when you talk to him for a while, um, he gets to be a personable guy. I, I consider him, he's a little too glib for my taste. I don't think he's a deep enough thinker, but he is an innovative thinker, and he does seem like a pretty nice guy. Just, in my view, a little superficial. Anyway, Kay says, um, many people like Yang everywhere. Yeah, true, true. Alvaro says, um, Evelina Pont, I have no way of knowing that. Sorry. Evelina says, really, look at that. Yang worked all over the country for Biden, too. Kay says, the Yang gang, quote unquote, is everywhere. Evelina says, uh, Bob Reich would be good. No, not as Secretary of Treasury, I don't think he'd be good. Kay says, 144,249 cases of COVID just today in this country. Shake my head. We're all going to die. Maybe all us old people, Kay. Kay says, yes, Reich would be great, Evelina. Not in that position, he would not be. Avril says, no, he's a neoliberal. Steve says, uh, Reich is a deficit hawk. Avril says, Kelton for Secretary of Treasury. Yeah, Kelton would be great for Secretary okay, of Treasury, but um, 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 Sarah Bloom Raskin would be great as well, and she has better contacts at the Federal Reserve uh, than Stephanie does, and she is also very seasoned, and also she would probably be uh, quite acceptable to Biden, or, or might be acceptable to Biden as the Secretary of okay, Treasury. I don't think Biden would be aboard for that, okay, necessarily. Uh, he might be aboard for Jamie Galbraith as the Secretary of the Treasury. But um, um, from my standpoint, okay, I think Jamie uh, would be uh, the best um, the director of the National um, Economics Council. Kay says, I'm not anymore Steve Gonzo. Evelina says, that's what I thought too, Kay. Kay says, um, but laugh out loud, Avril, you're dreaming with my eyes open. That will never happen. Avril says, Kay, why are you laughing at the fact that Reich is not for us? Evelina says, Warren is no, no, no. Warren doesn't know enough. She, she knows antitrust. She knows um, anti-Wall Street kind of stuff. She's good from that standpoint. But so would Jamie Galbraith be. So would Stephanie Kelton. There are a lot of people who'd be good from that standpoint. The essential thing that the Secretary of Treasury has to know is how the monetary system works. How it works. I don't think Elizabeth Warren knows that. I don't think she ever bothered to learn. Kay says, because you are judging him from years ago and he has changed. Alvaro says, oh, really? How so? Kay says, maybe you should watch some YouTube and learn a few things. I've been watching YouTube. I watch him on YouTube quite frequently because I like a lot of what he says. Alvaro says, he still bitches about the deficit, and until that changes, then he's useless. Evelina says, I like Roe. People will bitch about having another black woman uh, in the cabinet. Uh, 
I don't know. They might. Uh, that's not a problem for me. I mean, I don't, uh, you know, care about that. Uh, what I care about is uh, that uh, that Roe is really needed in the House. That's where he is really needed. We got to take over the House. It has to become a progressive House. We can't spare any of those people from the House right now. Steve says, I love YouTube, good political and historical shows, even movies. Yeah, I agree. I spend my whole day on YouTube. Kay says, um, um, I agree, Steve. Steve says, I don't think any progressives will be on a Biden cabinet. Doc's going to be very disappointed. No, I won't be very disappointed because my hopes for having um, any progressives in the Biden cabinet are not too high. Because I'm going to talk to you about the cabinet in the video I've been planning and I know very well who the candidates are that are on the press's mind, on the media's mind, based on leaks from the Biden team. Kay says, okay, I'm not going to argue with you, Avro. I'm done since you know it anyway. Avro says, when did I say I know it all? It's cool. Don't reason it out. I don't care. I do know Reich hasn't changed about the, the deficit. Evelina says, you won't be, Steve. Evelina says, I think we can all agree Stephanie Kelton would be great um, anywhere. No, we can't agree on that. She wouldn't be great anywhere. She would be very good as Secretary of Treasury, probably not as good okay, as Jamie Galbraith, because I don't think anybody is politically better than, than Jamie Galbraith. He has a real political sense a real political sense, lots and lots of experience at various levels, okay, of politics, various friends in the different branches, okay, of government. Stephanie just is not as experienced, okay, as Jamie Galbraith. And uh, um, 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 Jamie knows as much about the mechanics, okay, of money as uh, uh, Stephanie does, in part because he knew a lot to begin with, and in part because he also learned from Stephanie okay, and the MMTers in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. He's been working with the MMTers okay, at the Levy Institute now forever, forever. Steve says, Biden is being advised by Dick Cheney and putting Republicans on his cabinet. Kelton won't be allowed anywhere near the White House. Geez, Doc, no. That's not Kelton's entry into the White House. There is a possibility she'll be on the CEA. And the reason why is because Jared Bernstein is going to get onto the CEA. And Jared Bernstein will bring her on because he will think that an MMT voice is valuable. If for no other reason then he wants a voice to the left of himself so he can offer a compromise position. Oh, by the way, um, Jared Bernstein and Dean Baker co-authored a book on the job guarantee in case you didn't know. It's not the MMT job guarantee they favor, but they did. They do think the job guarantee is a serious idea and they wrote a book on it. If you want to evaluate the different forms of the job guarantee, the best one is the MMT job guarantee. Then uh, um, Derek Hamilton and Sandy Darity have a pretty good proposal, too. That comes next. The worst proposal uh, was the one from Jared Bernstein and Dee Baker, but that was better than no job guarantee at all. So just so you know, Kelton has already worked there, so it's not all that uh, far-fetched. Uh, she's worked in Treasury? No, she never worked in Treasury. She was an advisor, wasn't she? No, she was never an advisor to the Secretary of the Treasury. She was an advisor to Bernie Sanders. She was in the Congress. She was uh, the chief economist on the minority side, okay, with the Budget Committee. And for a month or two, she was the chief economist on the majority side, okay, of the Budget Committee. And she was also the chief economist for the Sanders campaigns, both in 2016 and 2020. But uh, to my knowledge, she has never worked in the Treasury Department. Now, she knows about the mechanics of what goes on there because 
uh, her early research okay, was on that. She certainly knows people in the Treasury Department. She's visited people um, um, in the Treasury Department. And she spent her life studying the detail of the operations they go through um, in the Treasury Department. Okay, there um, 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 are a number of MMTers who have been very, very concerned about that. But she never worked in Treasury. Steve said, Jimmy Dore did a more pessimistic and realistic show on shortlist uh, the cabinet peaks. Well, I'm going to do a what I consider to be a, a uh, to be a realistic show on cabinet picks um, uh, tomorrow, or maybe Friday. I don't know exactly when I'll get to it. I've scheduled it. It's there. I, you know, I'm ready to do it. Uh, and Evelina says it's a wish list, Steve. And Steve says Florida fifteen dollar minimum wage is a six year phase in plan. Yeah, not too good. Kay says, yes, Steve, worthless in my opinion. Steve says, um, Evelyn, it's a pipe dream. A death Santas of Florida is allowing free range killing of looters, even if the cops don't get um, actually notified. Evelyn says, ha, by the time it's all phased in, it'll be too little. It's too little now. It's too little now. It's been around since 2012 for eight years. Um, um, at a minimum, it should be $15 an hour in the lowest cost of living place in the United States and should be cost adjusted according to the CPI in every other local area um, in the United States. In New York, it should probably be between $28 and $30 an hour. Steve Wolfbrand said, uh, Republicans only need to one out of two in Georgia. We are screwed. Ah, oh, Steve, come on. Downer, 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 downer. I know it's realistic, it's realistic, it's realistic, but it's downer. And you don't know whether it's realistic or not because you're not on the ground there and you don't know what the hell is going on. That's the truth, Steve. I don't know what the hell is going on either, but at least I admit it. You just opine based on pessimism. We're screwed, we're screwed. Not necessarily. Evelina says, too late. Kay says, it's already too little too late in this country. Nancy says, time to go. Great evening, Dr. Joe. Thank you, Nancy. Evelina says, doesn't look good, does it? Evelina says, oh, I agree. The minimum wage, you mean? Yes, Evelina Pont says, K. Okay. Steve Wolfbrand says, the minimum wage should be 20 bucks. Like I said, Steve, it should, there should be a minimum wage for the lowest cost area in the country. Everything else should be cost adjusted. And you would get to minimum wages in certain areas like San Francisco, in L.A., in New York, Honolulu, I think, okay, in Anchorage, Alaska, you would probably getting, uh, you know, be getting as high as minimum wages of 30 bucks an hour. And that's appropriate in those areas. And Carmen says, as long as there are courageous politicians like the squad and Bernie, it's never too late. The public is becoming more progressive. $15 an hour passing in Florida is evidence of that. Okay, for one example, Evelina says, we saw that conf conflation okay, in the UK um, I used against uh, Corbyn. Yes, we did. And it's not a new thing. It's been used for years against progressives here who have been critical okay, of Israel. Uh, it's no protection to be Jewish. You still get smeared okay, as anti-Semitic, uh, even though you're Jewish. <laughs> Evelina says, um, but maybe you're right about Florida there. And by the way, even though a majority okay, of American Jews are critical, critical of Israel in the area of how they treat the Palestinians, it's now a majority of Jews who favor that position. Jews are not uncritical of Israel um, in the United States. Uh, the Jews who are uncritical okay, of Israel these days okay, are often the Trumpists and Republican conservatives 
and people getting paid off by the Republican Party. To them, everything Netanyahu does um, is wonderful. A lot of the rest of us think Netanyahu's a fascist. Alvaro says, God, I detest the religions. Uh, Evelina says, well, uh, but Israel okay, is a different thing because it's not simply a religious difference. It's now tied in uh, with a nationalism difference. And of course, there's also uh, um, um, ethnic divisions, okay, as well. So it's it's very complex. Evelina says, a lot of mud swinging in Georgia, too bad. And Steve says, uh, the Mossad was involved in JFK murder as well as Epstein blackmail. Mossad was involved in the JFK murder? Why would Mossad be involved in JFK's murder? I mean, he was in no way an anti-Semite. JFK? Come on. Steve says, uh, the AOC in 2024, okay, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe, could happen. Kay says, I don't know if she'd win, she might run against Harris. If we have Harris running in 2024, there's got to be a primary for the left okay, against Harris. Kay says, we need a national vote by mail in the country. Avro says, I think that the magic mushrooms would really help drunks. Glad they are available. Uh, they're going to be available in D.C., so the drunks will have to move to D.C. in order to get the magic mushrooms right now. Kay says, end the gerrymandering nationwide, too. Even Linda says, we have to be respectful of other people's beliefs, even if we don't have a credo. It's the way religion is abused that is a shame. Yes, it is. And Steve Wolfbrand says, keep an eye, okay, on Nitha Raman, um, a burner elected to the L.A. City Council, a rising star like Shaman in Seattle. You heard it here first. Thank you, Steve. I will keep an eye on her. Kay says, mushrooms are proven to help um, PTSD. Evelina says, totally. Steve says, the White House gift shop is now selling uh, Biden merchandise. Evelina says, oh, brother. Steve says, I grew a batch, going to raise another batch. Uh, it's at MidwestGrowKits.com. You're welcome. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Kay says, they better fumigate them first to uh, laugh out loud. Evelina says, uh, Steve Wolfburn, I like the fleshy Japanese ones in my food. Uh, the shiitakes, shiitakes. Avril says, sounding like Agov type of propaganda already. What fifth E hell do people need that junk for? And the White House doesn't need any money. This is a move to pitch um, the BLAE against red to keep the division going and people distract from ours. Yes. Uh, Steve says, um, Evelina, not those mushrooms laugh out loud. Evelina says, ha ha. Carmen says, um, Evelina Chitaki. And Evelina says, I've won those. Uh, Steve says, the ones Alice ate, okay, in the rabbit hole. And Evelina says, I'm for promiscuity with the uh, decrees. <laughs> with decrees. Steve Wolfbrand says, hmm. Evelina says, great fairy tale. Evelina says, Steve Wolfbrand, a little promiscuity then. Kay says, we had, uh, we had, uh, we had morels in our old yard in southeastern North Carolina, yum. Evelina says, you have the best backyard, Kay. Kay says, I did, Evelina, not anymore, sadly, sure miss it, though. Evelina, you were lucky I never had those things. Kay says, yes, I was for a little over 20 years. Hated to lose it when my late hubby died. Steve says, history will not be so kind to Trump. A quarter million dead uh, um, so far. It's more than a quarter million because we found earlier that if we look at the deaths from last year, compare them with the deaths uh, from this year, 
they're picking up a lot of other deaths that can only have been caused by COVID because there's nothing different other than COVID. By now, that gap is probably about 100,000. We're probably looking at 350,000 dead so far in actuality. Kay says, not only did I lose him, but lost it all. And um, Carmen says, Clarence Thomas is leaning against, is leaning against mandatory mask wear, um, but terrible news. Well, let him go without, and th th then maybe, we. well, <laughs> I'm not going to say that. Evelina, that's really hard, said. That's what Evelina says. Kay says, yes, it is. You have no idea till it happens to you. Um, Evelina says, can't expect uh, uh, um, much from him. She says, I'm sure. Hope I'm spared. Steve says, White House requests names of DOD staffers who applauded um, outgoing official so they can be fired. Kay says, Scott, I spent over 20 years building it from not much to a wonderful one-acre wildlife habitat. Steve says, sounds lovely, Kay. Was wonderful, Steve, and pretty much hurricane-proof, too. Evelyn says, uh, there's a lot of bees on both sides. Maybe Florida will set some precedence um, after all. Even when it says, um, i.e., minimum wage, money for infrastructure as part of a Green New Deal. Even when it says, um, i.e., Steve Wolfbrand says, Biden already said he's not into M for all, Doc. Are you talking about the other Biden that Joe said to, uh, to vote for? No. What I'm suggesting is that people can change their minds when enough political pressure is placed on them and when public opinion is strong enough okay one way okay and biden may yet change his mind biden is a politician he has changed his mind before he will change his mind again i don't know if he will when it comes to medicare for all but I think if we keep pushing for it, pushing for it, pushing for it, the more senators we get to go for it, the more it's going to look attractive to him. The Medicare for All movement is growing. It might be worth his career. I'm sure he's not thinking much about uh, his career uh, right now. But on the other hand, if he's not concerned about uh, 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 his career right now, uh, uh, but simply because he's so close to the end of it, then why should he be concerned about what uh, the donors think? I don't think he should be. Okay, I scroll too far. And Steve says, you're going to be very disappointed, Doc. Sorry, babe. Um, ain't going to do any of that shit uh, you mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? Well, you know me. I'm going to keep on mentioning it. I'm going to keep on fighting for it. And we'll see. And we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. History will not be kind to Trump. A quarter million dead so far. Case says, not only did I lose him, but lost it all. Avril says, Clarence Thomas is leaning against uh, uh, the, is leaning ag against uh, 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 on, on any mandatory mask wear, terribly new, terrible, and it's really hard. Case says, uh, Uh, yes, it is. You have no idea till it happens to you. Evelina says, can't expect much from him. Evelina says, I'm sure. Hope I'm spared. White House requests names of DOD. I read that already. Uh, I scrolled back up too far, so now i got to go down again. Uh, Evelina says, we'll only continue to go. Uh, 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 we'll continue to grow. Steve says, I'm going to be disappointed. That's all right. I've been disappointed a lot in my life. Avril says, he was Reich, deficit hawk, 
and Wolf just recently got on board, okay, with MMT. Oh, Rick Wolf got on board, okay, with MMT. Give me links, please. I haven't heard that. Give me links, because Rick's been fighting against MMT for years. Uh, uh, Steve says, uh, uh, YouTube is back up, Solar Flare. Yeah, I know. It went back up shortly before uh, 9 p.m. Eastern Time, about 10 minutes before 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Kay says, yeah, came back an hour or so ago. And so Lala Ram says, I personally recommend the true herbal legend, Dr. Zaka Cure, remedy for using herbal medication, blah, blah, blah. Even if Yang is a libertarian, wouldn't he be all about austerity? There's over 80 million entries. I don't think he's all about um, austerity. He hasn't indicated that. He hasn't talked about austerity, balanced budgets, stuff like that. When it comes to economics, he seems to be a one-trick pony. That trick seems to be the basic income. There's over 80 million entries in this. I'm not sure what Steve is sharing there. I think Sleepy Joe hit up Hunter for some crack. Sleepy seems pretty amped up lately. Kay says, new meds, Steve. Bernie will get nothing from Biden except the hard kick in the nuts. Steve says, Joe Biden upset, finally decided in Arizona. Democrats score 11 more electoral votes. Okay, I knew that was coming. I calculated it. Uh, how many votes was the margin in the end? I figured it was going to be about fourteen to 15,000 votes, that he would hold on with a fourteen to 15,000 vote uh, advantage. Avril, you're such a wet blanket in every single in-depth. It's so redundant. He's talking to Steve Wolfbrandt. Steve says, sorry, wrong link. Page randomly refreshed. Steve leaves... Steve Gonzo leaves a link. Thank you, Steve Gonzo. Steve Wolfbrand says, thank you. Avril says, so George is hand recounting every ballot. However, if by some weird stat, Agolf does win that state. What matter concerning the Electoral College points or whatever they're called, is it? No, it won't. As long as Pennsylvania stays in, okay, and Arizona stays in, uh, okay, it's done. Well, of course, Wisconsin has to stay in, too. But uh, with those 11 votes, we're up to 290. Uh, okay. um, only Georgia would now have to stay in the, uh, the Biden column. Uh, I think Biden's ahead by enough in Georgia to win Georgia. I think he's something like 15 or 16,000 votes ahead in Georgia. I don't think they're going to turn more than a few hundred votes. And that might go in, in Biden's uh, um, the direction. APAC dollars uh, determines who's anti-Semitic. No, we do. We do. The people at the bottom can determine who is anti-Semitic. We can counter the APAC dollars with our organization and with our opinions. Um, APAC's not going to tell me who is anti-Semitic. I'm going to tell them who was anti-Semitic. Okay. And Rahul Majumdar says, did Justice Thomas know Herman Cain? He may well have known Herman Cain. He may well have known Herman Cain. I don't know if he did or not. Avril says, if COVID debts continue to exceed, states won't have enough taxpayers anymore for local funding. Oh, and Kay says most states are already there. And Avril says, let's hope they both welcome the kiss of death for themselves. Avril says, I should rephrase that. Wolf is recently more receptive about MNT. Saw it on Real Progressives, Kay, a while back. Yeah, I think he is more receptive. He's been more receptive since he realized that uh, one thing MNT, Kay, is neutral about, if not even somewhat favorable to, is his program for getting cooperatives infused throughout the U.S. economic system. I mean, the MMTers are pretty big on cooperatives. Okay. 
And Rahul Majumdar says, Georgia, 14,057 votes, according to the New York Times. Thank you, Rahul. And Kay says, Veterans Day is the day I had to send Scott to hospice. I was afraid I couldn't pick him up for three days with no help. They didn't let him come back home as he kept falling down there, too. He was having strokes as the cancer had gone to his brain. Very sad day for me um, um, every year. Kay says, that year, Veterans Day was on a Friday. Um, Avro Mono, that's a sad song. Oh, um, 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 Avro Mono, that's a Sade song. Is that what you're saying, Evelina? Sade? Steve Wolfbrand said, uh, uh, Mossad wired the Twin Towers for demolition. I spent many hours researching this. Steve, <laughs> Mossad wired the Twin Towers for demolition. Come on. I mean, come on. We saw those planes hit it. Steve Gonzo said, I almost brought out the Hulk. <laughs> Avril says, um, 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 Evelina upon Kiss of Death. Oh, wow. Never heard that. And I listened to her. <laughs> okay. I've gotten all your comments. I've gotten through all your comments. Gotten through some pretty good stuff tonight. We are going beyond the election itself now. Trump has embarked on a big campaign to try to get the courts and the state legislatures involved. He's not doing his job, okay, president as president. He should be impeached for not doing his job, okay, as president in the middle of a national emergency. These are grounds for impeachment. He's looking after himself. He's not looking after the country. He's not looking after the lives of people. He's providing no leadership. He's a killer. He's a murderer. He needs to be impeached. Steve, um, Alvaro says, Steve spends many hours on YouTube uh, researching and Steve says, good night. And good night, Steve. Thank you for all the fun. <laughs> Kay says, thank you for another great discussion. I love you all. We love you, Kay. You take it easy. I'll be on tomorrow night at 9 o'clock again. And I'll be posting uh, short takes in between. Or not so short takes. <laughs> this week I have not so short takes. But they're not as long as the in-depth shows, I promise. <laughs> and Rahul Majundar said, darn, came in too late. Thanks, Joe. Uh, well, Rahul, on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and Saturday, I'm on at 9 p.m. So you can look for me at 9 p.m. And you'll pretty much always find me there unless there's some special event that causes me to postpone till 9.30 or 10. Avril says, um, but Pelosi needs to impeach the orange then. Yeah, she needs to impeach him again. Avril says, uh, yeah, medium takes. Yeah, they are medium takes. Maybe I should say progressive medium takes. Who knows? <laughs> change the name of this too. I should change it okay, to progressive long takes. Steve has almost caught an article theorizing it's not a coup attempt. Trump wants to demilitarize Maine while he can. <laughs> or is it uh, the Middle East he wants to demilitarize while he can? Okay, good night, folks. <laughs>